chapter 12, I simply want to read one verse of scripture. Revelation 12. John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes this statement. Verse 11. And they overcame him, speaking of Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. I am so thankful that Brother Copeland gave me the invitation, opportunity, to come and share a testimony with you. And if the next speaker doesn't show up, I have a few extra things to say besides. <laughs> this past April, the 12th, I had surgery to remove a tumor from the colon. It was a rather large tumor. They didn't realize how large it was until they attempted to remove it laparoscopically and could not do so. And then had to open my abdomen up completely to remove it all. When being brought into the hospital room, the doctors gathered, and I was informed that it was fourth stage colon cancer and 25 of the 26 lymph nodes were all infected. They took my wife out in the hallway to prepare her for what they expected the worst to be. My immediate statement was, and I had found it in this book a long time ago, I will live and not die. I will live again to preach to the living. Praise God. And from that moment, my recovery began. Praise God. In due course of time, I began treatment, which was recommended by the number one oncologist in our nation. God had provided through several of my brethren that I should fly to New York City as quickly as I could and meet with the lead oncologist in the country. And after all of his examination, he sat down with my wife and I and laid everything out on a level that we didn't have to ask, what does this mean? What are you saying? Where do we go from here? And he said, if you were going to continue being my patient, here is the type of chemo that I would recommend for you. And while we get your immune system built up so that you can continue your lifestyle. Now, I like that. He was Jewish. <laughs> I began chemo, a very lesser toxic chemo that you take by pill twice a day. And that was in the first week of June of last year. So there was a gap of time. And in that gap of time, I began to learn from several different sources that to get your immune system built up, you ought to be on a good nutritional program. That eliminates fast food and a lot of other things. And so we began to collect information and find out the source for these things. Because after all, folks, the scripture is crystal clear that your body and mine is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we ought to be taking exceptionally good care of this physical body that God has given us. I thought I was perfectly healthy. I had not had any sicknesses or a downtime. I just began to have a little uh, digestive problems and examination found the tumor in the colon. I thought that I ate fairly well and slept reasonably well. 
But since you and I are called into the ministry of our Lord Jesus, we need to take exceptional care of our physical bodies. Now, I knew that some time ago, God had directed Kenneth and Gloria concerning uh, this sort of thing, and he uh, has been a blessing to all of us, telling us uh, what we ought to do. And I think sometimes we pay attention, sometimes we don't. And sometimes we say, well, that was just good for Kenneth, but you know, I don't need that. But I found out that uh, my immune system was uh, terribly weak. In fact, the hemoglobin count before surgery was 7.6. I was terribly anemic and didn't know it. And uh, the CEA count, which is the cancer count, before surgery was 72. After surgery, it had dropped to 13.5. But I, my immune system was extremely weak. We got quickly into uh, good nutrition and uh, more healthy uh, uh, dieting, eating, and then began chemo the first week of June. But the third week of July, the oncologist in Dallas said, uh, the CEA count has dropped to 2.2, which is below normal for all of us. The medical profession do, uh, indicates that 4.7 is normal for all of us, that everybody has a few contrary cells. Well now, since I'm mentioning that to you, and the medical profession declares everybody has a few contrary cells, but if your immune system is strong, they control them. Uh, so let me recommend this afternoon uh, that you check out, up on yourself to make sure that you have a good, strong immune system. It's part of your taking care of the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen? And so we uh, thanked God that the CEA count had dropped to 2.2. And all the time I was on chemo, my hemoglobin began to rise. Now that's very out of the ordinary because normally when you're in, uh, taking a, a chemo, uh, it, it just attacks everything in your system and your uh, immune system is terribly uh, interfered with. Mine got increasingly stronger with every week. And by the third week of July, they were saying, we can't find any evidence of cancer anywhere. <laughs> Praise God. Now, I want you to know something else began at the same time. My brethren and sisters rallied around me. This is very important. And I realized that uh, uh, my brethren and sisters rallying around me was not anything new to me because I have grown up in the church. By the time that I was uh, a seven, we were in uh, a full gospel church uh, because my parents had both uh, been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Prior to that time, uh, I went to the Methodist church. And in those times, uh, let anyone in the congregation become ill and the saints of God uh, advanced on their location wherever it was and they did not leave night or day until that person was up rejoicing in the Lord and miraculously healed by the power of God. I grew up with that. And I thank God for my brethren that responded, some from many parts of the country, and many of you that learned that I was under attack went to prayer in my behalf. But in a very short time, I got a response from Billy Brim. We have gone to battle for you. And a number of her people just absolutely took my healing as uh, 
their determination to see. And so I am so grateful for you that prayed for me and those that stood by us night and day. God supernaturally uh, uh, came uh, uh, to uh, uh, do the work that his word so long ago said he would do. Remember uh, that Isaiah from chapter 53 verses 4 and 5 uh, uh, declared that by his stripes you were healed. That statement from Isaiah was made uh, in the neighborhood of about 600 years before Jesus bore those stripes. But by the time he had borne the second stripe, which made it plural, healing was made available to all who would believe, who would be so taught from the authority of the Word of God and begin to believe that exactly what the Word says is what God will do if we will only use the faith that the Word of God is creating in us every time we have an opportunity to hear the Word of God, either from the pulpit or by CD or DVD, or you just read the Bible to yourself out loud. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I was getting it almost 24 hours a day. It was wonderful. It kept my faith stimulated and laying hold of the healing that was rightfully mine. I listened to a DVD by Gloria Copeland, and she just point blank said, Take your healing. I said, You know, Father, I can do that. I can do that. And so with the faith that the Word of God had uh, provided for me, I took it. I took it. Now we went through lab work after lab work from the third week of July and PET scans uh, and uh, uh, they, they just simply could find no form of cancer. So I went back to work in the month of September. Praise God. I'm back at work. Hallelujah. And thank God for strength and energy. And I praise God that Peter said many, many years after Isaiah prophesied, prophesied it in 1 Peter 2.24 that by his stripes we are healed. So Van, if we are healed uh, by his stripes, I am healed. Hallelujah. And I'm thankful to God for all of his goodness and his mercy and the power of God uh, that changes facts. Now the facts were I had a very serious physical problem. But truth changes facts. And that works not just for physical healing, all right? Not just for physical healing. Truth changes facts. And you and I are part of a camp that call ourselves Word of Faith, Word of Faith people, and we are. But I think it's about time that out of this camp begins to come the most miraculous demonstrations of the power of God uh, through you and I that uh, are part of this camp that our nation has seen uh, in quite a long period of time. Now we do uh, have times in which uh, uh, we get together and God is with us, but so many of our churches today, I say to pastors oftentimes, do you have healing services? And sometimes I get a, what? Do you have healing services? Because folks, let's face it, the population of the United States is sick. And it's, it's moved into the body of Christ as well. Mine was an attack of the devil. I'm not gonna have that. I will not put up with that. Amen? And the Father has made uh, provisions uh, to supply us with the armor of God and the power of God and the ex exciting name of Jesus uh, so that we don't have to put up with these sort of things. And then thank God for all, as I mentioned earlier, all the reinforcements that came my way. Make certain 
that you become a reinforcement for others around you uh, when they too are attacked or maybe by the foolishness of their lifestyle they have opened the door uh, uh, for uh, sickness, disease, or infirmity to seize upon them. So I'm thankful that long ago John declared that by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony we overcome. Our testimony is extremely important. I have shared it at every opportunity uh, uh, throughout these months. I will continue to do so. Just a little personal story that's very recent. Just before Christmas, we were in a lovely church on the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio. And I announced on, on the, in the early Sunday morning service that uh, at the close of the second service on Sunday morning, I would be praying for the sick. I shared my testimony with them all, and we had uh, excellent crowds, uh, very, very good crowds, and uh, uh, even a better one in the second session uh, than in the first. Now, the second session in this church on Sunday morning does not begin until 11.30. That's their regular starting time for the second session. And uh, uh, so I was no hurry, in no hurry to get through. And I finished my sermon somewhere around 120, 125, and then called for those that wanted to be prayed for. Now I said, if you've just got a little sniffle because the weather's changing, or you've got a little uh, uh, sinus headache because the weather's changing, and you understand that, you've gone through it before, and you've taken authority over it in the name of Jesus and dismissed it, and uh, I I'm not asking you to come forward. If you've just got some little physical, uh, 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 you know, uh, discomfort, you can take care of that in the name of Jesus. But if you've got a chronic situation of any kind, you come forward. I want to lay hands on you. And I thought, my thinking was, I didn't tell the pastor, he's here. My thinking was, and he didn't ask me to tell you this, I was going to tell it anyway. But I thought that there would probably be maybe 30 people. There was a congregation of uh, uh, well over eight, 900. And I thought, well, perhaps there'll be about 30 people that'll come forward for prayer. Lo and behold, I laid hands on the first one at 1.35 in the afternoon. I laid hands on the last one at 20 minutes to four in the afternoon. I, Brother Copeland, I hadn't had a healing line like that since I was under my gospel tent back in the 1950s. The power of God was so evident. We had deaf ears open. We had people in serious condition, uh, uh, instantly set free, and the pastor's father, who had cancer, uh, miraculously healed. Uh, folks, I want you to know God is ready uh, uh, to perform uh, uh, what the Word of God says He will do. We only need to give Him an opportunity to do that. Amen? So this afternoon, and... Uh, there's some other things I'd like to share with you, time permitting. I'm watching the clock, and I know where to stop. When you've been around uh, ministry as long as I have, you learn a few things, and one of them is when the Holy Spirit pulls your coattail, he means stop. And I'll not be like a great man of God of some years ago that used to say, I've come to say some things that God wants uh, said, and when he gets through of a few things of my own. <laughs> and uh, you, could, you could always tell where God stopped and he started. But <laughs> I, I, promise, I promise not to do that. That dear man is enjoying uh, the benefits of heaven at this time. But I want to have prayer for those of you that are battling a chronic situation. You have been attacked possibly by cancer, a lung problem, a kidney problem, perhaps a chronic condition of headaches, something that's, that's really been giving you a tough time and trying to hang on. Those are the ones I want to pray for this afternoon. 
And I'm going to believe the God to instantly deliver you and set you free. I am not here because I pled with Brother Copeland. I did call him and say, uh, somewhere during uh, uh, this minister's conference, may I just give my testimony? And then I get a call, will you take one of the sessions on uh, Wednesday afternoon? I'm delighted and pleased to do so. I haven't had a chance to persecute you uh, uh, since uh, Y2K back in 2000. (laughs) You will remember? Healing is a divine provision and benefit that our Heavenly Father has lovingly provided for you and I through His Son Jesus Christ uh, who bore those stripes uh, on His back until hunks of flesh uh, were literally ripped out uh, and He did it for you. God wants you whole. He wants you healed. He doesn't want you uh, uh, continually dragging around sickness, disease, uh, and infirmity. And I find that over in the Old Testament uh, that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, the Word of God declares there was not a feeble one among them. (laughs) Oft times people ask, uh, how old are you now? Well, as of uh, four days ago, I am three months and four days into my 88th year. Now, folks, come on. I, I, we, you and I have been taught from the Word of God by very anointed teachers. And I think it's about time we really believe what we've been taught. I am persuaded by what I find in this majestic book that since it was the mind of God that the children of Israel, something close to three million of them, uh, would not have a feeble one among them, uh, that prior to the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the resurrection of the righteous that have gone on before us, and then the catching up of the ready uh, uh, to meet Him in the air, uh, that we're going to enjoy a company of believers, uh, a huge company of believers, among whom there is is no sickness, disease, or infirmity. I'm recommending to pastors everywhere, get back to having healing services in your church. Don't let a service go by that you don't make the, open the door for anyone that needs healing to come forward and have the elders lay hands on them in the name of Jesus. So, this afternoon, If you're battling cancer, a lung problem, kidney problem, pancreas problem, serious back problem, any chronic situation that you've been resisting, I want you to stand where you are. Don't move out of your seat. Stand where you are right now. Thank you. Thank you. I prayed before coming to this service, Father, there's going to be so many, and we have another speaker in a little while that has a word from God, and that word needs to come forward. I said, how shall I go about ministering to these that will stand, and there's quite a number of you. And the Holy Spirit said, have them remain where they are. And then I'm asking that at least two people that believe the Word of God have experienced divine healing, supernatural healing, that are not doubters, but believe if they lay their hands on these folks who are standing, uh, something supernatural is going to take place. So I want two uh, believing believers to go quickly to these that are standing. Two to each one. Two to each one. Now, you that are standing while believers are coming to you, 
Let them know what it is that they don't, don't pray yet. Don't pray yet. Just set yourself in agreement with them. You're setting yourself in agreement with them. Tell those that have come to lay hands on you what it is you're believing to be healed of in this time of prayer in the name of Jesus. Tell them now. Now, if there's anyone standing and no one has come to you yet, raise your hand. If you're standing and no one has come to you yet, here are some folks back in the uh, uh, back area. I see about four, five, six, seven hands. Uh, and we need some believers to get back over here. If you have to leave your seat, uh, uh, do so. Go believing. Uh, lay your hands on them. Keep your hand up till someone gets there. Anyone else? Anyone else? God is in this place. The Holy Ghost is in this place. Jesus is walking in between uh, of these pews. Uh, now, in the name of Jesus, lay hands on them and command that sickness, disease, or infirmity to loose its hope. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus uh, that healing uh, is flowing uh, uh, throughout all of this sanctuary. And men, women are being loosed and set free. Let your healing virtue flow like a river here today, I pray. God, I rebuke all manner of sickness, disease, and infirmity. And I thank you, Father, for setting free and making whole these for whom we are praying right now. In Jesus' name, be healed in the name of of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Now, it's not we hope so. This is not a hope so salvation. This is not a hope so salvation. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Take it. Take it. It's rightfully yours. Jesus paid for it. It's already done. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all give the Lord a praise for what he has just done and will complete what he has begun. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, when you can, you may be seated. I have just a few minutes. While off the field, I fed, and I'm not exaggerating, I fed on the Word of God and prayed in the Holy Ghost. Those two things are a daily part of what Hilton does. I've had a good prayer life in the past. I've had a good study life in the past. But I found out I could improve them both. Amen? Amen? And so I did. I am continuing to do it. And let me encourage you. Feed on the Word. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Resist every symptom. In the name of Jesus, resist it. Do not give in to the spirit of fear. 
God has not given us the spirit of fear. So fear is coming from our adversary, the devil, and we don't have to put up with it. Hallelujah. In the early weeks, I had some battle. But invariably, at the height of some of the battles, there would be a knock on the door. Or the telephone would ring. And it was a man or woman of God with just the right word at that very moment. It was wonderful. Our God is doing these things, and it's exciting. It's exciting. So I'm thankful that there is coming a glorious restoration of the supernatural within the body of Christ. The supernatural in the body of Christ. Thank God that the Holy Ghost has anointed Sister Gloria to have healing services in all of their major affairs. Thank God. But you see, we need them in all of our churches on a regular basis. On a re don't, don't just wait till the next time uh, a brother and sister Copeland are uh, uh, putting a, a number of days together somewhere and say, well, I'm going to try to get there and maybe I can get in, in the healing line. Or, or she'll say just the right things that will spark my faith uh, and I can grab this healing uh, that is rightfully mine. And the word maybe I just used should be left out. Amen? No maybe. No maybe. Now, one other thing that came so strongly to me, and I learned this growing up in uh, uh, the church, that this physical body does not belong to me. When I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, He had purchased it with His blood. This is not Hilton's body. The Father owns it through the shed blood of His Son, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen? And you need to realize uh, that you belong to Him. You don't belong to you to do as you please whenever you want to. Amen? And realize that the Father wants you absolutely healthy, whole, and about the assignment that He has given you. Well, I have just a few minutes and the Holy Spirit said to me, if you have a few minutes, offer just a little bit of Bible prophecy. Is that all right? I won't take but just the minutes that I have here. There are two majestic prophetic books in the Bible. Now, you see, there are more pro pro prophetic books than just two. Oh, I know, but there are two outstanding ones. I know we have Isaiah through Malachi in the Old Testament, which includes one of those two very majestic prophetic books, Daniel. And then we have a prophetic book in the New Testament, Revelation. And so the Holy Spirit said, if you have a just a few minutes after prayer and exhortation on the Word. Talk a little bit about these two books. And I said, thank you, sir. I can do that. I have now spent well over 50 years with the prophetic Word of God. I'm no stranger to Bible prophecy. I'm no stranger to the gift of prophecy. And I'm continuing to study because I don't know it all. But what I do know is so exciting and thrilling and motivational, I want to know some more. Amen? We are admonished by the Apostle Paul to preach Jesus. Thank you. I'll receive that from all four, 302 of you. What about the rest of you? We are admonished to preach Jesus. Yes. That's better. If you preach Jesus, you have to preach the book of Revelation. Someone said to me recently, Hilton, uh, that's your assignment, not mine. Oops, I'm sorry. But the scripture tells us 
We are to preach the Word. And the Word starts in Genesis 1-1 and does not conclude until Revelation 22-21. Why aren't you preaching the whole book? You say, well, I'm a specialist. <laughs> no, you need to be a preacher. So, well, I'm a teacher. Good. Teachers can preach. Amen? When I look at the ministry of Jesus that is outlined very briefly in Matthew 4, 23, it says that he went about all Galilee in their synagogues, here it is, preaching, teaching, and healing the sick. That is the ministry into which you and I have been called. There isn't any other. That is it. That is it. I have been divinely called into the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Uh, to be actually truthful with you, Hilton Sutton does not have a ministry. Hilton Sutton does not want a ministry. I'm not trying to build a ministry. I have been called supernaturally into the ministry of my Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the ministry that I am to advance morning, noon, and night wherever I am. And that's true of all of us. Now, you'll hear us talk about our ministry, but understand we're talking about our assignment in His ministry. So there ought to be preaching and teaching and healing the sick. Boy, that's all about Jesus. But if you preach Jesus, you need to preach the book of Revelation. After all, from Revelation chapter 1, verses 3 and 11, it is clearly stated this is the book to be taught and preached in the churches. I have folks all the time say, well, Hilton, one of these days we'd like to have you come and teach the book of Revelation. I'd be delighted to, but why aren't you touching on it? We've heard so many negative things about this book. Oh, so often I hear, it's a book of hidden meanings. Well, now, if it were a book of hidden meanings, God didn't title it right. If it were indeed, as some folks say, a book of hidden meanings, he should have called it the mystery. Figure it out if you can. <laughs> and most of our believers are going about trying to figure it out if they even touch it at all. And most of them stay away from it because they say, oh, that book scares me. Isn't it strange, Brother Copeland, that the God who doesn't give us the spirit of fear would conclude his book with a horror story? So from Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. What does verse 3 say? Frightened, troubled, confused, and almost driven out of their minds are those that read this book. No. This is the only book in the Bible about which a blessing is declared right at the beginning. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and they who hear the word of this prophecy. Blessed. And this is the camp that believes in blessings. Hallelujah. Then we've got to include the book of Revelation. You'll say, yes, but that's the, where's the other reference? It's, it's in verse 11. Verse 11, that is to be taught in the churches. Can you say, Hilton, can you confirm that? Oh, yes, chapter 21, excuse me, uh, uh, chapter 22 and verse 16, same statement. So we have uh, three different occasions in the book of Revelation where this book ought to be in the churches. And if you preach Jesus, you've got to include the book of Revelation because it is all about Jesus. It's not about the tribulation period. It's not about the Antichrist. It's not about the mark of the beast. It's all about Jesus. All of it. What's first one? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, it covers the tribulation, but it covers the remainder of the church age. It covers the seven years of tribulation over which Jesus is Lord, not the Antichrist. In the 22 chapters, there are more than 55 direct references to Jesus and only six to the Antichrist. 
The Antichrist is not a major personality in the book of Revelation. And most of us were taught in the classroom as well in the, uh, church meetings that there would come a one world government and the Antichrist would rule the world. That is not Bible. You can't find a reference in the book that confirms that theology which is mistaken. Now you're quiet. So since you're so quiet, get quickly into Revelation chapter 6 and verse 8. My time is running out. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 8. In Revelation chapter 6, Jesus is opening uh, uh, four of the seals, uh, six, uh, rather six of the seals uh, of the book that the Father has given him in chapter 5. When he gets down to the fourth seal, verses 7 and 8, out charges a pale horse whose rider uh, is death accompanied by hell. Look in your Bible, Revelation 6, 8, the very last sentence. Does it read as mine? These, speaking of the white, the white horse rider, the red horse rider, the black horse rider, and the pale horse rider, have authority or power over how much of the earth? It's in every Bible in print. Our theology that there's coming a one world government and the Antichrist will rule the world is not Bible, never has been Bible, isn't going to be Bible. Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, this earth belongs to our Heavenly Father. So says the 21st Psalm, uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, and He never lets uh, anybody else take it away from Him. You say, what are you going to do uh, uh, with the UN? You mean the United Nothing? <laughs> what are you going to do uh, uh, with the European Union? Well, if you study the book of Daniel, that's another wonderful book, and I don't have time to talk about it. Uh, the seal, by the way, that was on the book of Daniel is gone. It is no longer there. You say, how do we know that? From Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Daniel 12, 4 will let you know uh, how to discern that the seal that was placed on the book of Daniel has been lifted. Uh, he said it is lifted when there is great mobility, men going to and fro on the earth, and knowledge increasing. Uh, and we are in that time right now, and Daniel called it the time of the end. Uh, that is not a doom and gloom term. It simply means, thank God, it's Friday. <laughs> That's all it means. If you keep it in proper context, it only means, thank God, it's Friday. Hallelujah. Bible prophecy is so exciting, it gets me up. Sometimes it keeps me up. Hallelujah. Well, going back to Revelation 6, 8, the Antichrist, according to the Word of God, you say, there'd be a lot of preachers that don't agree with you. They're disagreeing, no, not disagreeing with me, they're disagreeing with the Bible. He has authority over only one-fourth of the earth. Now, I've got about 30 seconds. You say, what one-fourth, Hilton? <laughs> For that, we go to the book of Daniel, and it is the European, Middle Eastern, North African area, the Mediterranean area, and that's it. When we research the Scripture, we discover from the, the ninth chapter of Revelation, the Orient does not follow him. We discover from the 19th chapter of Isaiah, the Arab world does not follow him. And from the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, we discover there is a wilderness of people who have plenty of everything, and into that wilderness in the second half of the tribulation, the unsaved remnant of the Jewish family are whisked away with the two wings of a great eagle into that place of hiding where the people there care for them and feed them. And when the Antichrist demands their release, uh, they tell him, shut up and mind your own business. <laughs> Who is that wilderness? Well, if I had another 15 minutes, I'd show it to you in the scripture. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. But I want you to think with me. Many of you have, th have degrees of theology. I have one of those. 
Many of you have degrees of ministry. I have one of those. But my most prestigious degree is a doctorate of divinity bestowed on me by the American Baptist Church for my multitude of years, decades, of studying and researching the majestic book of Revelation. I really value that one. Now, it's interesting when we really search the scriptures to discover that Daniel identified kingdoms with certain animals. Daniel chapter 7, 8, and 11. And we get over into the book of Revelation and John does some of the same. So there is a pattern of interpretation established by the Word of God through Daniel and John. Since this pattern is already established, the two wings of a great eagle that whisk the remnant of Israel into their hiding place has to be only the United States of America. I'm using the pattern established by the Word of God. Now, others have suggested this. Well, when I sit down and talk with the uh, uh, theologians, they all say, Hilton, you can't do that. Well, I am. <laughs> I have. I'm going to continue doing so. Since Daniel did it and John did it, that's a biblical pattern that has been established. And when you look at the two wings of the great eagle in Revelation chapter 12, of that whisk away of the remnant of Israel into the place of hiding where they're fed and cared for and protected, and the Antichrist can do nothing about it. There's only one spot on this globe, and that is the United States of America. And we have been the arm of God's evangelism almost from our beginning in the late 1700s and we have been the protector of the Jewish people and the state of Israel almost from the beginning and that brings us under Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 and we have been since 1916 the world's peacemaker at great cost of our lives and properties and, and monies we have been the peacemaker of the protector of the people of, uh, of Israel and God's arm of evangelism and he's not through with this country yet. Amen. Amen. I've gone five minutes over my time so Dr. Winston can add that to his time. <laughs> you have been a joy and I'm grateful for the privilege of sharing with you. Now you say, where can we get all this material? Now, now give that to the Lord. Don't give it to me. Give that to the Lord. Give him praise and glory. Give him praise and glory. I'm just a servant. I'm just a servant of the Most High God. Just a servant of the Most High God. Now, get on our website. It'll be helpful for you for, with biblical prophecy. Go by our product table. The young man there is well versed in our material, and he can help you. Thank you, Dr. Copeland, for this opportunity. Love you, too. Pray for you and Gloria every day. Amen. We go a long way back together. I wish I had time to tell them all, tell everybody about it, but I won't do it this time. Maybe some other time. But God bless you. And Dr. Winston, preach your heart out. Praise God. God bless you all.